Donald Trump is no longer president, but he is associated with one of the biggest headlines of the week, the mass shooting in Atlanta. On March 16, during a Fox News interview, Trump referred to the coronavirus as the China virus. Later that day, eight people were shot in a mass shooting at an Atlanta area spa. Actually, it happened over three different locations. The majority of those killed in that mass shooting were Asian women. Now, there's nothing to tie Trump directly to the shootings, but experts say his statements and repeated use of terms like the China virus can be linked to attacks against Asians. Beyond inflammatory and xenophobic language, today we are asking what is driving Asian hate crimes. All coming up next. Live from Los Angeles, this is The Special Report. The mass shootings at three Georgia massage powers and spas left eight people dead. Six of them were women of Asian descent. A 21-year-old white man has been arrested and charged with eight counts of murder. The suspect told police that the attack was not racially motivated, but was caused by his sex addiction and that he lashed out at sources of his temptation. These statements spurred outrage and widespread skepticism given the location of the shootings and the fact that most of the victims were Asian women. Many members of the Asian American community see the Atlanta area murders as a haunting reminder of harassment and assaults that, they've been, uh, that have been occurring from coast to coast. According to recent studies, hate crimes against Asian Americans were up by 149% between 2019 and 2020, even though hate crimes overall have declined. Activists say these crimes are hardly new and the causes go well beyond Trump's use of the term China virus. Here for my lead off panel is Mei Li Chai. She is an award-winning author of 10 books, including Useful Phrases for Immigrants, She's also a professor of creative writing at San Francisco State University. And the day after the Atlanta shootings, Professor Chai wrote a compelling op-ed article in the Los Angeles Times, putting in perspective America's objectification of Asian women. Good morning and welcome, Professor Chai. Thank you so much. And thank you for covering this talk topic. I really appreciate it. Oh, no, my pleasure. I, I hate that we're talking about it under such dire circumstances, but I was really uh, just moved by your op-ed piece in the Los Angeles Times. That's how I found you. I read that article, my produ a producer read it, and, and we were both moved by, by your, you know, your personal story about being objectified yourself. Even though you're an educated woman, you were working as a professor. Can you tell us a little about what happened to you? Sure. I had just started a um, tenure track position in North Carolina at a um, university that had a nationally recognized creative writing program. And I was just getting ready for work one day and there was this loud knock on my door and it was two police officers, a white woman and a black man. And I was shocked. And the woman said um, that someone ha um, had reported that they had heard screaming coming from within my apartment, a woman's screams, and they wanted to make sure that I was okay. And I said, I, that's so weird. You know, I haven't heard anything. And they said, can we, the woman asked, can she could come around and look and make sure that I wasn't being held against my will. She wanted to make sure that I wasn't being trafficked. Uh, because apparently one of my neighbors and all of my neighbors were white in this apartment complex had called in and reported that they thought there was um, an Asian woman being, you know, trafficked in their in their building. And that is um, so I let the police officers in. I didn't know what else to do, even though that's in and of itself terrifying. Um, I didn't know if I was being set up. I didn't by whom um, the police officer went through my entire apartment and then they left. And um, I, you know, for the rest of the day, I felt, you know, really creeped out. I was like, you know, what, what was I doing that would give this impression? I had, there was no noise in my apartment. I didn't even have the TV or the radio on. And all I could think is that this is just the stereotype of Asian women that somebody, some of my white neighbors had, and they just were trying to understand why I had moved in. Um, previously, 
um, earlier, a, a white woman had followed me across the apartment complex shouting out, Konnichiwa, Konnichiwa. And she said she'd been a missionary in Japan and wanted to practice Japanese with me. And I said, you know, I'm Chinese. And I just, you know, I've never had that happen. That was so bizarre also. Um, but it goes to show the stereotypes that are so limited of Asian women in the United States, that I'm either a foreigner who can't speak English, you know, um, or I'm a uh, sex worker, you know, perhaps a victim of, of trafficking. And I think that ties into the coverage of the murders in Atlanta. Yeah, I just want to ask you, Professor, where does this, this racist trope that, that Asian women are sex workers, what's the origins of that? It goes back to 1875. It's really, really old. Um, when the United States wanted to limit Chinese immigration, um, they banned Chinese women from becoming to coming, even just coming as immigrants to the United States. And in 1875, it's called the Page Act. And it was, they said, because the possibility of Chinese women being prostitutes. That's all they could see Chinese women coming to the United States for, not as you know, a mother or a daughter or a wife or as an entrepreneur, they had to be sex workers. And then from then on, we've seen this trope repeated over and over again. If you look at um, the militarization, um, the military industrial complex, if you look at how US troops are stationed throughout the Pacific, um, and Asian sex workers are recruited to serve the troops. And then Hollywood jumps in. And if you think about the depiction of Asian women in Hollywood movies, it's been utterly atrocious. We're never fully human in Hollywood movies. We're most often portrayed as sex workers and not as hardworking women who happen to work as sex workers, but as objects for consumption by white men. Um, endlessly willing objects without much agency. And I'm not even going to repeat the disgusting lines that have become, you know, pop culture um, tropes. It, that, I mean, you can see them in cartoons, you can see them um, as, as jokes in other movies that don't even have Asian women in it. They're a joke between white men when they, when they talk about Asian women. Help us understand how, how the, the, the horrific crime uh, crimes that took place in Atlanta relate to this this whole hypersexualization of, of Asian women and the violence that we see perpetrated uh, against women, particularly those that do work in massage parlors and, and spas. We know those women face an, an inordinate amount of, of violence just in the work that they do. What's the connection between the, the shootings you think and, and that you know the sexual hypersexualization of Asian women? Well, think about how they, the, the women, the victims, the innocent victims were immediately dehumanized by the uh, sheriff's department in Georgia. The spokesman, you know, when in a press conference explaining why this killer did it, uh, he said, oh, well, he was having a bad day and this is what he did. Um, and then as an excuse, he said they had the, the sheriff's department said, oh, well, you know, he had been they had interviewed this the killer and he had said it wasn't racially motivated. Um, in fact, it was motivated because he had a sex addiction and he was trying to get rid of the sources of his temptation. Well, excuse me, you don't get to kill human beings just because you think they tempt you. Two, Asian women are not the source of temptation. We are human beings. We have every right to exist as full human beings here and elsewhere and to be portrayed in the media. And then the media, unfortunately, the mainstream media picked up this trope and kept repeating it and kept repeating it. And we didn't see the names or the backstories of the women until until many, many days later. And in fact, it was the Korean language press and the Chinese language press that managed to get interviews with family members and started portraying the women as humans first and yeah. not just sources of temptation for a white man. Yeah, you know, we, we've seen this, the sex made me do a defense used often by white men, powerful white men in particular. We saw it with Harvey Weinstein. We saw it with Anthony Weiner uh, in New York. Uh, and, and let's, for the record, most psychologists will tell you that sex addiction, addiction is not a recognized you know, mental health issue. And it, it becomes, in many instances, just uh, an excuse for bad behavior. And in this case, an excuse for criminal behavior. 
And then we saw with respect to that sheriff that you identified, not only did, did he make that dehumanizing statement, we later learned that, that he uh, had made a post on his Facebook page uh, urging people to buy a T-shirt with words COVID-19 imported virus from uh, China, spelled C-H-Y-N-A. Uh, so the, the fact that they would have someone like him even speaking to the public uh, about this atrocity is really mind boggling when you think about it. Uh, I, I want to ask you, though, about, you know, how this form of racism, you think this this objectification of, of women, this, this trope that Asian women are less than human, that they're only, you know, here for the pleasure of white men. How has that uh, played into the other attacks outside of Atlanta that we've seen happening, you know, really across the country, uh, you know, Asian people walking down the street and getting spat upon and, and getting, you know, attacked by people just randomly. How do those racist tropes play into some of those attacks that we've seen? Well, they're all connected because it's all about the dehumanization of Asian people um, in general and certainly um, of Asian people in the United States, because we are Americans and we have a right to be here and we are fully human. But because of the racist rhetoric of former, former President Donald Trump, we have been continually in the media, in the highest platform in the entire world, dehumanized for, for four years, even during the campaign in 2016. Um, candidate Trump was um, spouting xenophobic uh, rhetoric, hate speech against Mexicans and the nation of China. China is raping us, really a sexualized, disgusting term, um, implying that it is a threat, um, existential threat to the United States. And the Center for Public Integrity has done a study, and they published this in February during Merrick Garland's um, uh, conf confirmation hearings. And they discovered that um, in other administrations, whenever there's some type of um, tension between the United States and another country, the federal government has stepped up and tried to reduce those tensions for members of that um, ethnicity in, within the United States. After 9-11 under Bush, the um, Justice Department reached out to uh, South Asian and Muslim American groups to try to mitigate what they knew was going to be uh, terrible tensions within the United States. Um, in, during the SARS outbreak in 2003, also the Bush administration, the CDC, and other federal agencies reached out to communities to try to mitigate those effects. Center for Public Integrity has shown that Trump's administration did nothing, did nothing to mitigate the effects on the Asian American community that the federal government knows can happen anytime there's tension between the U.S. and another country. Before I let you go, Professor Chai, I just want to ask you, what do you think is, is the most effective way that the Asian community and allies to the Asian community can, can really push back, uh, you know, this narrative about uh, Asian women and how they are objectified and how they're viewed as hypersexual? What's the best way to push back on that narrative? There's multiple ways. One, I appreciate you for having this program and focusing on this issue, so bringing attention to it, to rec so people can recognize, oh, you know, and see Asian women doing other things, speaking as community members and as fully human as fully human Americans. But also, you know, when you see a movie and it has a kind of racist joke in it like that about Asian women, you know. Stop and think. Don't laugh along. You, you know, you you could write a letter, you could write an op-ed, you could also talk about it among your friends and families. It's really important that we all speak up and we have this conversation and not just absorb passively these really ugly stereotypes. Yeah. Well, we've got to leave it there. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Chai, for your advocacy. Uh, again, you are the author of Useful Phrases for Immigrants. Appreciate your work and your advocacy. And thank you for sitting down with me this morning. Thank you so much, Ariva. I appreciate it. All right. Now, my next guest is Tiffany Diane So. She's a journalist who writes on Asian American issues, sex work, gender, and policy, and the intersectionality uh, of those things. She's also the co-founder and leader of the Asian American Feminist Collective. Uh, good morning, Tiffany. Hi. Uh, well, uh, it's almost after. It is afternoon for me, but yes, good afternoon. Okay. Well, <laughs> Thank you so much. Good afternoon to you. And Thanks for joining me from the East Coast. So, uh, Tiffany, we've seen the reports, over 3,000 attacks, depending on, you know, I think I saw this morning, one report said they're closer to 4,000 attacks on Asians in 2020 alone. We, we saw uh, Senator Tammy Duckworth and others saying that even this is a gross undercount as so many attacks go underreported. Why do you think 
uh, you know, people in the Asian American community that do suffer these kind of vicious attacks, why aren't they speaking out and reporting them? Why is there this undercount that, that Tammy Duckworth talks about? I mean, first of all, it's just based on the ways that our, like, you know, systems of reporting and criminal justice play out. Um, you know, first of all, there's not much language justice. Um, and like language access. Um, and there's also a you know, major distrust of police because uh, Asian communities have also been victims to violence by policing um, and oftentimes you know, marginalized and left out. So I feel like, um, yes, there is an issue with underreporting, uh, but then at the same time, it, we need to also ask you know, where, what is going to happen with these reports? Um, you know, whenever we do discuss um, you know, hate crimes and incidents of you know, racial bias and uh, violence, you know, what ends up happening? And most of the time it is going to be a more pro-carceral response and one that ends up you know, uh, causing more harm to communities of colors, including our own Asian American community that um, you know, we also want to be really cognizant of whenever we talk about um, reporting. And, and Tiffany, help us understand. So the Asian community is, is broad, and, and I've been watching a lot of the reports that that have been uh, you know broadcast over the news over the last week after in the wake of these shootings. And I think people think the Asian community perhaps is monolithic. Help us understand how diverse the Asian community is. And when we use that term, we're talking about people from different countries that speak different languages, that have different norms and different traditions. Absolutely. I mean, I feel like um, like any of the, you know, like census racial uh, indicators, there often is a lot to be desired in terms of, um, you know, disaggregating data and also understanding, you know, the different nuances of who falls under that umbrella. So I feel like, you know, similarly with Black Americans or, you know, Latinx Americans, our community is also very diverse. And, you know, we are, some of us are, you know, fifth generation Americans, some of us are new immigrants. Um, you know, we come from so many different countries from Asia and the ways that, you know, we migrate here and our, um, you know, financial, um, economic, our um, educational, you know, resources and access are all very different depending on which community we come from and what our migration history is. Um, and so, you know, we do like to, within the Asian American Feminist Collective, we want to really um, broaden the understanding of Asian America as a political identity and one that that is actually a coalition in order to build power and also, you know, raise awareness to our issues, um, you know, across the board, ones that we do also, uh, you know, we all experience, right? We all experience this anti-Asian violence and bias and racism, whether or not uh, we are actually Chinese um, as we've recognized. And so I think that there are ways that we can talk about Asian America as, a you know formation as a political formation and racial group, but without also flattening our experiences um, and allowing you know people to define Asian America under this very monolithic uh, model minority um, you know framing. Well, let's talk about Chinese people in particular because we know that Trump, uh, in the comments that he made uh, when he has referenced the coronavirus, you know, and he did this repeatedly, making jokes about calling it Kung Flu, uh, you know, calling it the China virus. And, and many say that he put a target on the backs of Chinese Americans and, and Asians in general. How significant do you think, uh, you know, Trump's comments have been in terms of some of the attacks that we've seen, these random attacks that we've seen on the streets? Yeah, I mean, when you give, you know, a white supremacist the largest platform in the country, it's going to have an impact. And we know that Trump is just a symptom of the issue, a larger structure of white supremacy. And he is just one person who has risen to power. Um, and there are going to be more Trumps out there. But the fact that, you know, he had such a powerful position um, as in our was at the top level of our executive office and was using Chinese people as a scapegoat, a racial scapegoat 
scapegoat, you know, which we know has historical ties. Um, you know, as Professor Chai had mentioned, you know, there are so many times in which Asian Americans, Chinese Americans have been scapegoated for, you know, being vectors of disease, um, you know, for uh, spreading, you know, our depravity um, among, you know, white Americans, as, um, you know, the PAGE Act very clearly indicated, right, that we are, um, you know, only going to be you know, in America spreading venereal diseases to white communities, um, as well as, you know, the ways that um, Japanese Americans were scapegoated during World War II, um, the ways that, you know, Muslim Americans and South Asians also bore the brunt of, you know, this um, uh, Islamophobia in the wake of 9-11. I think that we just see so many different patterns um, where the, it's not just obviously, you know, what is happening. We know that um, COVID-19 has impacted our communities all, you know, drastically, uh, but then the ways that, you know, media informs us about that, the ways that our leaders inform us about the issues, um, that really matters. And obviously um, it really emboldened a lot of, um, you know, violence and hate and, um, and that we're seeing this all bubble to the surface in these different, you know, horrific acts that have been more widely, you know, uh, publicized, but that, of course, we know that there are, you know, these different underlying um, and less, less discussed, you know, ways that um, this also impacts all of us. Yeah, talking about being emboldened, I'm sure you saw the, the racist and inflammatory pro-lynching statements uh, made by Representative uh, Texas, you know, Congressman Chip Roy. I want to play a little of, of that video and get your comments on the other side of it. The victims of race-based violence uh, and their families deserve justice. And as the case, what we're talking about here with the tragedy, what we just saw occur in Atlanta, Georgia. I would also suggest that the victims of cartels moving illegal aliens deserve justice. The American citizens in South Texas that are getting absolutely decimated by what's happening on our southern border deserve justice. The victims of Rioting and looting in the streets last week, businesses closed, burned, la I'm sorry, last summer, deserve justice. Um, we, did, we believe in justice, right? There's old sayings in Texas about, you know, find the, all the rope in Texas and get a tall oak tree. Uh yeah, those statements, you know, we saw an immediate backlash uh, from uh, representative, obviously Grace Mean for one, brought her to tears, uh, had a powerful response, uh, but then, uh, Roy just doubled down, refused to apologize, said he, you know, and he just continued to, uh, you know, make these kind of dog whistle racist statements. Do you think folks like Roy have been emboldened uh, by Trump and, and, and how much damage, you know, does that kind of comment coming from a United States congressman do to, uh, you know, Asians, you know, the one, you know, Asian people who we've been talking about who have been the subject of these kind of vicious attacks? Yeah, I mean, it's atrocious. Um, and I will say that, you know, coming from Texas myself, you know, I know this to be attitudes that have been, you know, around since before, obviously, Trump was in office. Um, you know, as we know, lynching has been, you know, a, a real issue, right? Like, it's not, it's not something that you can just conjure up uh, in the way that he did, be, it, it, and also drawing in connections between Black Lives Matters rallies and this type of, you know, like anti-Asian violence was a clear motive for him also to pit, again, our communities against each other. Um, and also, you know, by using this kind of, or using this kind of like violent language, um, and also then if you keep on watching him talk, he also ends up bringing in like the abuses of, um, you know, China's government against human rights. Um, then, you know, to also distort, you know, right, like this lived issue where it's like, okay, well, we also now have to um, pertain to like, you know, what China's policies are in order to also like experience and talk about our own issues here in America. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm just very incensed by um, everything that he said, but also I just feel like um, it's just, it's once again trying to dig into that, you know, racial divide um, and to pit Asian Americans against Black Americans to uh, make sure that we don't unite under, you know, this 
fight in this battle against white supremacy because it's much more value or it, you know it just serves them way better to like keep us to divide than from, just, yeah and, and from organizing together and yeah. um you know by bringing in this like pro-carceral this like anti-black language into you know our congress it's just clearly um it's it's a very clear ploy um and i see right through it and i also yeah, i want to bring i want to i want to stop you right there because i do want to bring into this conversation jamie swift she is the executive director of black women radicals and co-creator of the black and asian feminist solidarities project and melody uh, Moisey. She's an attorney and professor at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and she's the author of multiple books, including The Rumi Prescription, How an Ancient Mystic Poet Changed My Modern Manic Life. Uh, welcome to the show, Jamie and Melody. I wanted to bring you ladies in because uh, uh, Tiffany uh, hit on something that we've seen being played out in the wake of these uh, shootings in Atlanta. And, and it is this, this fight that's happening or has happened, or some people believe is happening between ethnic groups uh, and efforts to try to pit ethnic groups against each other. Uh, and uh, some of that is driven by this, this, this concept, you, you touched on it, Tiffany, this model minority stereotype that Asians, that Asians have it all, that they're super successful, that they don't have any problems. Uh, and I just want to talk about how has, has that stereotype of being the model minority you think excluded Asians in some ways from conversations about race. Uh, I'll ask you, Jamie, you work with Asian groups. How has, what do you think that model minority stereotype has done in terms of, of how African Americans even perceive Asians? Well, I think when you talk about white supremacy, global white supremacy, you have to recognize that white supremacy produces revisionist histories, right? usually from white male cis heteronormative perspectives, right? And when we talk about the, this white supremacist notion of the model minority, you dehumanize Asian and Asian American communities, right? And you don't see um, the diversity and see the extension of, of the oppression that they've had to face, right? Um, in our country. And so it's, it's a lot, but we, there's layers to this, right? What we're seeing is not anything new. Um, there has always been efforts to pit uh, uh, different ethnic groups and different races against one another when we come together to address white supremacy, right? And so it's our responsibility to be principled and in, in studying and in our struggle to read, to learn, to know, to overcome these stereotypes so that we can put together these critical connections, particularly at this time uh, between Black and Asian American uh, communities, because we have a long history of solidarity uh, that people do not understand or do not recognize, right? So how about we address uh, those white supremacist uh, revisionist histories, right? But also learn, study, struggle together. And that's why I appreciate the Asian American Feminist Collective and our collaboration together because we have a reading list, right? So people and audience members can go to that reading list and recognize and understand this uh, generative long history of struggle between black and Asian American communities. Well, well, Jamie, I agree with you that there's a long history of solidarity between black and Asian communities, but also there's a history of, of intra-ethnic conflict and the relationship between Asians uh, and African Americans in, in some cities, particularly cities like LA and New York, have been fraught uh, with conflict. I, I think back, I, I live in Los Angeles now. I was in Los Angeles during uh, the Rodney King beating. Uh, you know, there was a, a shooting that took place uh, shortly thereafter. A Korean store owner shot and killed a 15 year old African American girl, Latasha mm -hmm. Harlins, Harlins uh, believing that she was trying to steal a dollar 79 you know bottle of orange juice she shot her in the back uh and there was you know widespread protests from the african-american community even though uh this korean store owner was charged she eventually was convicted of, of manslaughter not murder uh and basically was given community service and probation she did not see any jail time uh and there's been uh, really tense relationships between african-americans and koreans over you know liquor stores and communities access to higher education. So I, I don't think we can gloss over. I, I think we've got to recognize what those conflicts have, have, have been like uh, and then talk about how we move from there. Uh, and obviously there's been a lot of progress. That's over 30 years ago. But 
can you speak to you know that conflict because I, I think it's real and, and I live in Los Angeles well I don't think it's real I know it's real because I, I've lived it here in Los Angeles and yes, we know it's real too, right? And I think that's one positive aspect about our collaboration, Black Men Radicals collaboration with the Asian American Feminist Collective. We don't gloss over that. We speak about it actively. There are anti-Black anti -black sentiments, feelings that the Asian American community has towards the Black community. I will never refute that. And then there's also anti-Asian stereotypes and prejudices that the Black community has with the Asian American community, right? And that is what white supremacy does. It pits, like once again, communities together. I mean, against one another, right? And so there's never been this refuting of this historical tension, right? It's always been addressed, but how, what can we do to not only address it, right? And discuss the Latasha Harlings, to, to, to discuss the Rodney King rise, to discuss um, um, tensions when we go into like, uh, hair stores or nail salons and, and all sorts of things, right? But how do we move forward? Because when we keep talking about we can talk about that all day long, right? The tensions, but what is something that we can move towards solidarity so that in the future, actually in the present and future, we can learn from those challenges, right? And learn from those histories of tension and to move forward, right? Because we're at a critical political juncture um, where we're seeing heightened white supremacist terrorist attacks, um, not only against uh, black, black communities, Asian communities and other communities, right? So how can we come together to learn from our past and to create a better future? Yeah. I want to get, yeah. No, I think you're right about that. I want you to jump in, Melody. Uh, you know, a good friend of mine, an opinion writer for the LA Times, she wrote an op-ed uh, this morning, actually, and she said that Blacks and Asians experience racism differently given our respective histories. Do you agree with that statement? Certainly, I think, I mean, all different minority, minoritized groups experience this differently. And I think white supremacy, Jamie made such great points because white supremacy benefits off of all of this. And it's intentional. Let's not pretend that it's not an intentional strategy carefully designed and executed to divide those of us, us within these minoritized communities because God forbid we actually unite if we do we are no longer a minority, we are the majority. The second we unite, we become a threat to white supremacy, the likes of which they understand, but the likes of which they've never seen because we've been too busy fighting amongst ourselves. Melody, Melody I wanna stop yeah. you for a minute. I, I wanna play devil's advocate here for a minute yeah. because you know, I'm the biggest uh, proponent of you know, er eradicating racism and white supremacy in every form that exist. And if you watch the show regularly, you know, I'm always railing against it. But I do want to talk about our responsibility in the Black community, Jamie, and Tiffany and Melody in the Asian community. Or are, are, is, is white supremacy to blame for the, the negative attitudes that African Americans have towards Asians? A lot of it around the fact that African Americans are at the bottom of the caste system and, and Asian Americans happen to be the most, you know, financially successful uh, root really in the country, uh, some of the sentiments that Blacks have towards Asians. Do we bear any responsibility for that, Tiffany? Uh, uh, Tiffany and Jamie, I, I want to get both of your comments on that. What, what role do we play in, in some of those attitudes that we see played out in our communities every day? I mean, I do feel like, yes, we all do have an individual responsibility, you know, to try to move forward in a way that does not bolster white supremacy, um, but that we do know as Melody and Jamie have been mentioning that we do live in a real, you know, racial caste system and a hierarchy in which, you know, people have now, you know, it's like a white and black binary in which black is at the bottom and white is at the top. Um, and then now, you know, trying to right place Asian Americans or like Latinx communities within that. Um, and oftentimes it is in a way, right, that pits us against each other, but that ultimately of you know what is also underneath this all is that you know through white supremacy through us um like you know capitalism and global cla capitalism you know we are creating a greater um economic divide right that the wealth gap is getting wider and wider and that the people who the you know working class communities and marginalized communities communities of color are being forced to fight for you know the little scraps that we have left and this is creating a system right where 
um, you know, racial minorities are then, you know, forced to be pitted against one another in order to have the same opportunities, the same access and resources um, that, you know, white people are just guaranteed um, or, you know, wealthy white people are just guaranteed. And so um, I, I, I want you and I don't want to be like dogmatic about this, but I live in Los Angeles. So so Jamie, if you live in South L.A. and there's a, a Asian liquor store on every corner in your neighborhood, what are you saying to those black residents that live in that community? They they don't see white supremacists. They they're not thinking in the, in this global way that that we're having this conversation. They're saying they're they're Asian storekeepers that charge us exorbitant fees for subpar food in our community, and they're poisoning our community and they're profiting from it. That's what the black person that lives on 180th in Los Angeles is saying, what do we say to that person? How do we get that person to this more global perspective that it, it, it's not the Asian storekeeper, but it's this bigger, you know, uh, you know, capitalism, white supremacy that, that's driving this? Help. Representative, help. Representative, help. All right. Please hold while I transfer you to a banker. So... Um, for, for me, um, and going back to the, to the individual and the collective, right, we are all pacified and co-opted and absorbed in this white supremacist state, right? And so it is required for us to not only individually decolonize ourselves and decolonize what we've been taught, because that's another, I keep going back to white supremacy, K through 12, we're not talked about, we don't even learn about our own black histories. Jamie, I want you to talk to the lady, the black woman on the corner that has to go to that store. What, what, what do we say to her? Help me talk to her. Well, it has to, it really has to do with, with education, right? Right. Like she's looking at the Asian American or the Asian store owner. Right. But it's beyond that. Right. And I, I, I don't know how you would want me to speak to her, but what I can offer is, is that it's language about, that she understands fifth grade language. Um, <laughs> In language that everyday people, not, not that she's not smart. She's super smart. She's educated, but everyday language. Okay, I don't want to assume how people digest information and what they can understand, but it is about education, right? Like, I keep going back to that point all the time. It's about education. It's recognizing that if you are, we're a part of this collective system, right? That all that, that does oppress us, right? But we do have an individual responsibility to see beyond that. And particularly we're black activists, right? We love Dr. Angela Y. Davis, right? But she has ties to and is committed to oppressed peoples around the world, right? And has worked with Yuri Kochiyama with the film. Uh, we, we can reference Yuri Kochiyama working with the Black Panther Party and working with Malcolm X, also known as El Haj Malik Al Shabazz. We can talk about Nellie Wong and Merle Wu uh, uh, writing with Kitchen Table Women of Color Press started by Kumbahi River Collective founder Barbara Smith. It goes back to education, right? To see that we do have ties with one another and it's not just the individual front facing discrimination that you see or prejudices that you see between the groups every day, that there are also people out there willing to work, willing to, to address these issues, just like what we're doing with uh, Black Mer Radicals and the Asian American Feminist Collective, right? We're not a monolith. Right. Yes, these instances do happen, but there are people willing to work with one another who get it or who, or who are trying to get it. Right. And so that's what I would tell that black woman. Right. Uh, or, or even my family members that there that we're not we're, that we're all that there are some of us that are willing to work together to address these issues. And we're part of, of a greater history and lineage of those people who are willing to work together despite our differences. Uh, Melody, do you think the fact that the Asian, six Asian women that were killed in Atlanta, that, that they don't represent what people's, uh, you know, stereotypes of the model Asian minority is, you know, these were working class women, you know, uh, some single moms working in what would be considered an undesirable profession, you know, they weren't high tech, they weren't in Silicon Valley, you know, they, they weren't making six figures. Do you think the fact that these women are from a different socioeconomic class, that that might be the, the thing that, that brings them into the fold and, and causes other ethnic groups to, to see them, uh, you know, in a way that perhaps Asian Americans aren't typically seen in this conversation about race and racism. Yeah, I think in America, America really loves its binaries and they want to say things like it's either about class or it's about race. It's always about both. Um, and we, we shouldn't, when we forget the giant capitalist system in which we live, we, we, when we forget 
patriarchy in general, and obviously it affects different groups differently. Um, but when we forget the way that it affects us broadly, and we forget the fact that it benefits from us fighting amongst each other, that's when we end up losing. Yeah. Uh, well, we've seen a, a lot of African-American organizations and celebrities stand up in solidarity with the Asian community. Questlove, uh, you guys know him from The Roots. He was accused of actually making racist comments about Japanese people some years ago, but now he's been uh, uh, outspoken of, you know, activists on uh, and posting anti-Asian hate content on his Instagram page. He has about 2.2 million followers. Uh, and he's just one of many uh, celebrities that we've seen, you know, standing in solidarity with the Asian community. I'll ask you, Tiffany, last question. What do you think allies, people, you know, African-Americans, you know, Latin Americans, uh, people uh, from different uh, ethnic groups and, and, you know, communities can do to better support uh, the Asian community and, and stand up against this kind of violence and hate that we're seeing? Um, yeah, I mean, as for Questlove, I will say that I do give everyone room to like grow and learn and that, you know, as we were having these conversations, I think a lot of people are reckoning, right, with their own potential biases that they might have internalized themselves um, just through, you know, right, growing up here in America and learning through our like, you know, educational system, which tends to, right, favor, um, you know, the white, um, you know, hetero patriarchal like narrative, like Jamie had mentioned. Um, but that also, you know, I think what Professor Chai had said at the beginning was really great about just kind of, um, you know, taking the time to maybe question some of these like social norms, some of these jokes, some of these like, you know, ways that um, Asian Americans get stereotyped, um, you know, as the model minority or as, you know, like, um, submissive, um, hypersexualized, you know, women um, who are trafficked, right? Just to kind of take a little bit of time to um, talk to, you know, your Asian friends and <laughs> figure out how to, um, you know, move forward in a way where we're not um, adding, right, to that divide. We're not adding to um, these ways, right, that Asian Americans um, are becoming, are, you know, like perpetually foreigners or the ways that we're, um, you know, just further marginalized within uh, communities of color, which I don't, I also am not here to wag fingers or point at anyone at all in particular. I think that we're all just here and we're growing and, you know, Asian Americans are growing uh, minority within this country. And so I think that there's just a lot to learn and there's a lot of, you know, educational spaces to be held. And I'm really excited to like continue these conversations, especially, you know, with folks like you and Melody and Jamie who are interested in, you know, like bridging these gaps and bridging these cultural divides and um, really like coming up with solutions um, and, in, you know, and moving forward rather than um, just still connecting to or um, only sticking with, right, like these uh, past cultural or, you know, past uh, racial tensions that we can, of course, you know, like speak into, we have to like continue to remember and um, we have to continue to like recognize our differences, uh, but then at the same time also recognize how um, white supremacy and, you know, patriarchy um, and, you know, U.S. imperialism and capitalism impact all of us in these different ways um, and how we can work together to, you know, really create a world that we would like to live in. Well, thank you so much. Well said, uh, Tiffany. Thank you for your advocacy. Thank you, Melody. Thank you, Jamie. You women are, are doing amazing work. Uh, keep lifting your voices and, and being uh, such a bright light for, for all of us who are trying to find ways to be supportive because uh, any group, any ethnic group that's targeted, it's like we're all being targeted. So we're all in this together. And so I really appreciate all of your voices. All right. Now we're talking about some of the legal issues that uh, have been in the news as it relates to this mass shooting. I want to bring on uh, Marita Escubanes. She is an attorney and director of strategic initiatives for Asian Americans advancing justice. Uh, good morning, Marita. Good morning. Hello. So I know you have been involved with uh, legal cases representing marginalized populations in your career. So what are the chances that this shooter that, that killed these eight people, the senseless violence that took place in Atlanta, what are the chances that it will be charged with a hate crime? So it sounds like that is still under investigation, still in process, right? Um, so I don't know. But I think looking back at the conversation you had with your first guest, the professor, I think a lot of what is so 
has been so hurtful to our community about this crime, other, I mean, the fact that it happened at all is terrible, but the initial response by law enforcement was deeply problematic, right? The fact that from the outset, they were ready to dismiss this as not being a hate crime, sort of buying into and elevating the accused narrative, as opposed to actually digging into not whether this involved racism or whether it involved sexism, but rather the intersection of the two. Right. And we know that Georgia has a new hate crime law. Uh, my understanding of the law is that uh, it's actually a sentence enhancer. So when someone is charged uh, and if they're convicted for the underlying crime, uh, you can get an additional two years on your sentence. And, and no one's been charged under that law. And I, I want to talk a little about why it's important, even if, if that law doesn't result in that enhancement, it's really important that we call out hate crimes and that we prosecute them and that we start to collect data uh, on hate crimes. Why has it been so difficult, you think, in this country to prosecute under whether it's federal hate crime laws or even a state hate crime law like the one in Georgia? I think the importance of having hate crimes on the book is this deeper acknowledgement that the individual that was targeted was not targeted because of anything that they did, rather, but because of an aspect of their identity, right? So hate crimes laws give different treatment to crimes that can be proven as motivated by some sort of impermissible animus, right? Whether it's on race, sex, gender, gender identity, etc. cetera. Um, but proving motivation is hard. Right. So that is one of the inherent difficulties in all of this. But I think the signal that having these laws can send to communities that, you know, we will not tolerate hate crimes um, is an important one. But we also encourage people to report hate incidents. So the acts of verbal harassment on the street that might not necessarily rise to the level of a crime, we feel that it's important to surface and talk about those too, because those are also deeply hurtful um, and are contributing to this larger environment that we're all living in now, right? Where so many of us are fearful that we are going to be attacked because of our identity and because Asian Americans are being blamed for the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which is just wrong, it's irrational, but it's happening. Yeah, I, I want to bring into the conversation now uh, Dax Valdez. Uh, I know that he is a, a trainer with Holla Back, which is a grassroots organization really trying to help everyday people know what, learn what they can do to, to push back on harassment and, and hate in all forms. And I know that AAJC has a new project with Holla Back. So good morning uh, and welcome to the show, Dax. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Uh, you're an actor. Jack, you, you are a director, you, you are creative, but yet you're a trainer with Hollaback. How'd you get involved with this organization and why? Uh, well, I think the, um, it boils down to um, fighting for our humanity, right? As it was um, shared earlier. And as creative storytellers, we have, we have a mission to mind the humanity and the stories that we share. So this is a natural evolution of that uplifting the humanity of those who are feeling oppressed and harassed is a natural transition to um, being able to share these tools effectively because we're connecting with people, whether it's in person or how we've been doing it over the last year in the virtual space, being able to make a connection and make people feel and hear and see the humanity in others is, is key. And so in our partnership with Advancing Justice AAJC, we've reached over 20,000, 10,000 in the last month and a half um, by equipping people with small actions to make big change, five strategies that anyone can do anywhere and still feel safe and comfortable and to take care of the person who's experiencing the harassment. Yeah, we want to talk about some of those steps, this bystander training that you, you know, the two organizations are engaged in uh, to help stop this anti-Asian xenophobic Harassment. One of the things that I found most interesting in reading about the steps and the project was uh, the natural inclination to call the police. I, I think I read you said, don't do that. Don't call the police. Because in, in many instances, police can only escalate situations. Is that, am I getting that right, Marita, that, that one of the steps is not to call the police? 
we caution people against doing that as their initial response. Um, we recognize that many people, including Asian Americans and others, might have real reluctance to engage with law enforcement, right? Perhaps they're concerned about their language skills, their immigration status, um, just any number of levels of fear and distress. So we just caution people not to make that their first response. But if there's the opportunity to do so, check in with the person who is facing the harassment and find out from them if that is an intervention they want. Yeah, I read a story about a woman in, I think she was at LAX, and there was someone, uh, a, a white man and his son, uh, and he was having a disagreement with his Uber driver, and he was yelling uh, insults at the Uber driver, and the, the woman, she was a white woman, she started filming it, and, and she intervened, and she said something to the man's son, like, you know, I hate that you have to see your dad act in, in, in such a belligerent way, and the man got really, of course, hostile with her, and told her to get a husband or, you know, start making ridiculously stupid statements towards her. So Dax, if you witness someone being harassed like that situation, you know, what should you do uh, in terms of uh, to, to, to disrupt the situation, but at the same time, you know, protect yourself? Because safety obviously is key in these situations. So, you know, if you're going into a situ situation like that and you don't have enough information, I, I don't know what's going on. But as a bystander, if I was there, I would probably say, hey, what's going on? Something to get um, clarification and then try to address what's going on by taking care of the person in conflict, asking these clarifying questions, trying to clear the air. And then if none of that is working, then what our work focuses on is the person in conflict, getting them out of there, getting them to safety. And so with that, with that example, it, it's, it's hard to know. And again, when you're just documenting something without doing something else first, we usually recommend that you delegate asking somebody else to step in before you start documenting. So there are a number of steps that we didn't see beforehand that may or may not have taken place. Right. And but um, asking that clarifying question is great. Pardon me? I was going to ask Marita, what about videotaping? So we've seen, uh, you know, some folks who've been criticized for going, you know, getting involved in situations and starting immediately to turn their video camera on rather than taking some actions to try to, you know, disrupt the situation. What does your program teach about the use of video? When should it be used and how should it be used appropriately? So there's a reason that Hollaback's methodology is the five Ds of bystander intervention. There are five different tactics that you can use, including document. But as Dax was saying, we typically advise people to try to turn to something else first, whether it's to delegate, ask someone else to go get help before you turn the camera on, right? Or focus your attention on the person being harassed, even as perhaps you're trying to document. But documentation alone isn't going to solve anything, right? It can be a useful tool in the aftermath. But an important point on documentation, we always urge that when you are capturing the moment, that you provide the documentation to the person that was facing the harassment and let them decide what to do with it. Um, you know, if you're going to blast it out on social media, you could be adding to the, the victim is the, the trauma that the person is experiencing. It's not for you to decide what, what should be done with that. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that because I do feel like, you know, there's some people who act like they work for TMZ. They're running around you know, with their cameras all the time looking for difficult situations, not because they're trying to you know, raise awareness or, or help the victim, but because they want to go viral. You know, they want to have that first you know, uh, published video so that you know, they can get credit or they can grow their followers or whatever, you know, grow their influence on social media. So I, I think it is important that you note that you, you need to be respectful of the victim in that situation and give them the opportunity uh, to do what they want to do with that, that videotape or that documentation, because not everybody wants to be, you know, the, the next New York Times front page story. Uh, some people want to handle these situations, you know, privately in, in ways that they believe uh, are most important. Uh, we've talked about document. Uh, we've talked about disrupt. What are the other three Ds, Dex? So the one is distract, and that's creating a distraction to de-escalate a situation, whether you pretend to drop something so that it makes a loud noise or you pretend to spill something. And we also recommend that you don't have to drop anything. You could consider starting a conversation with the person in conflict, and you don't have to talk about or refer to what's going on with the harassment that's occurring. But talk about something completely unrelated, like asking for directions somewhere. Or if you see somebody who is being harassed, 
Maybe you run up to them and you pretend you know them. Oh, I'm so sorry I'm late. Oh, who's this? Okay, well, thanks. We got to go, right? And you, again, we are focusing on the person who's experiencing the harassment and we want to make them feel as safe and cared for as possible. The other one is delay. So this is checking in with the person after the incident of harassment is over and you make an offer of how you can support them because sometimes the moment of harassment is so quick, like somebody drives by you and yells a slur and you're shell-shocked or the person that was yelled at is shell-shocked, going up to them and say, I'm sorry that happened, are you okay? That can be really validating because likely the other times that they have been harassed, nobody checked in on them. And then the last one um, that we haven't mentioned is direct. And this is the one that a lot of people think about when they think about bystander intervention. And that's some version of, hey, stop doing that, whatever that may be in combination with one of the other strategies that we teach. Marita, is that last strategy one of confrontation? Should you really go up to someone in the throes of a attack and try to confront them? So throughout the training, we emphasize safety, right? Trying to assess the situation, do a check-in with yourself, determine if you're the right person to intervene, make sure you're honoring your instincts, right? Like if you feel like this is not safe to intervene, that's why there's a delay. You can check in with the person after. Um, so it's not always the right thing to do, but you know, if you do decide to take direct intervention, we encourage you to just make a direct statement, like, hey, that's not okay, back off, but not engage in a back and forth with the person, right? Because we just, yeah, that's probably not going to help. So it is just setting boundaries, naming the problematic behavior, and, and just trying to get de-escalate the situation. Yeah. And sometimes you can use direct before it even gets to um, the person when they're escalated, because we also teach what to look out for. So if somebody's saying a, a joke that is inappropriate, you can use direct and just say, hey, can you explain what's so funny about that joke? Something like that would probably give the person an opportunity to self-correct and you don't actually have to accuse them of anything, but they can take a moment and be like, oh yeah, maybe that wasn't appropriate in this moment or at all, right? So there are, there are a myriad of ways to use direct as well as all of these other strategies in tandem well, thank you so much, Dax. Thank you, Marita, for your work. Uh, AAJC, Hollaback, this collaborative is, is phenomenal. Uh, people can go to uh, either of your websites and learn more about how they can get involved and how they can learn these strategies uh, to really uh, become allies and to be helpful to people who are under attack. We know uh, hate crimes are up exponentially against Asians, and, and we all have a role to play uh, in ensuring that those numbers come down and that, that the kind of hate that we're seeing uh, exhibited on streets, you know, across this country, uh, that we put an end to that kind of hate against all people, uh, and particularly people of color and people of Asian descent. So again, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. And thanks for joining me this morning. All right. I want to say thanks to all of my incredible guests this morning and to all of you for tuning in. Uh, my heart, can't say it enough, my heart goes out to the families of the victims uh, of the senseless shootings uh, in Atlanta. Uh, I grieve for these women, for the six Asian women that were shot. I grieve for them. I grieve for the victims of, of Charleston, El Paso, and the, the most recent shooting in Colorado. Uh, however, I am so encouraged by the outpouring of support from people all over the country, particularly African-American activists like we saw this morning, Jamie. Uh, I see the potential to expand the social justice movement that has Black lives at the center and the eradication of all forms of racism as its goal. I hope that as a result of this incident and in the wake of this incident, uh, we can lock arms, we can join together, we can keep our focus on the real villains and understand that the biggest threat to all of us are white supremacists, not each other. Just some quick words to live by before I get out. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King famously said, returning violence for violence multiplies violence adding deeper darkness to night already devoid of stars. I wish Texas Congressman Chip Roy had read this quote before he made the ridiculously racist comment about lynchings and justice. I also wish he had paid attention during his high school history class, because if he had, he would have remembered that in 1871, a mob of about 500 white rioters attacked, robbed, and killed Chinese residents in downtown Los Angeles in what is referred to as one of the largest mass lynchings in U.S. history. 
17 to 20 Chinese immigrants were tortured and hanged by the mob and bodies of the dead could be seen hanging at different places in LA's Chinatown. 17 bodies were stacked in a nearby jail yard. Only 10, 10 of the 500 were prosecuted and those that were sentenced had their convictions overturned on a legal technicality. If this all sounds too familiar, it is. It's because white supremacists have a long and sordid history of lynchings. Thousands and thousands of African-Americans were lynched in this country during the Reconstruction era. And it is against this backdrop that people of all races and ethnicities should stand in solidarity, should stand in solidarity with Asians, African-Americans, and Latinx, and all marginalized people against violence, against racism, against xenophobia, and against ignorant congressmen who have the audacity to use the word lynching in the same sentence with justice. Ain't nothing about a rope and a tree and a noose justice. I'm out, y'all be safe out there, wear your mask, and remember we are all in this together.